Kirsty is the Principal Solicitor with the New South Wales Environment Defenders Office. She has worked for the Australian Government Solicitor's Office, the Office of the Attorney General in Samoa, and the Cape York Land Council. Uh, she's been involved in a number of high profile climate change, mining, biodiversity, and planning legal issues. Uh, and is currently representing the Barrington Gloucester Stroud Preservation Alliance, who are challenging the project approval for the AGL Gloucester Gas Project. Welcome, Chris. week, <laughs> probably dealing with these types of issues all week, and a lot of coal mining. Um, there are still a lot of communities out there fighting coal mining, just in case Tom doesn't know. Um, so if I'm not, I've probably switched off a bit, so you're just going to have to bear with me. But it has been a pretty roller coaster week for us. Um, the EDO, um, as some of you may be aware, is um, a community legal centre that does public interest in environmental law. So we're involved, and I think about probably... Now about 50% of the work that we're doing is related to mining or coal and gas. It's really exploded in the last couple of years since I joined the EPO five years ago. Basically because of the number of community groups that are coming to us who are concerned about these, the environmental impacts of these issues and um, who are just concerned about having a say in the process and what the law may or may not do. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is really about the state of the law. But you have to bear in mind that I do have a perspective on this because obviously um, we are a legal centre that's about improving environmental outcomes, so we're not unashamed that we are about trying to use the law to get better environmental outcomes. And we're also about, also about um, trying to educate the community about what the law is so that you can participate better in the process and so you can see what the deficiencies are that are in the law and you know advocate for change where you see it might not be working for you. And there's certainly a lot of opportunities in this area at the moment to do that because there's a lot of changes going on with the law. Um, so I've explained to you about what we do. So we give people legal advice um, and we represent them in public interest environmental cases. We run about 15 test cases a year on different issues and I'll talk to you about the one that we're running for Barrington fairly shortly. What I'm going to be talking to is going to be fairly general. It's not going to be specific to your area. So it's just going to be looking again. Probably, you know, not, um, you know, to all credit to Tom, what he said about the particular local issues. And a lot of the issues that we're going to be talking about are probably more about coal and gas as it relates to the process around the state. Um, we also look at policy and law reform. So one of the big things we've been working on at the moment is um, a mining law reform discussion paper because communities are not happy with the state of the law. So that's, that's something that's on our website for those of you that are interested. And also there is an inquiry going on at the moment that there's some information about, about coal seam gaps in the parliament. And it's the kind of thing that we will write submissions and advocate for better environmental laws as part of that. We also have a community education program where we get people to go around and educate communities about what their rights are. And we have two scientists on staff, which is great. That can explain things. So we have an environmental law advice line, so you can call us up any time, although I would say to you that a part of the group, one person from each group, other than that's okay, you know, David. Just to give you the perspective, I guess this is part of the problem, it's just the number of patrol, um, CSG um, exploration titles in your area. This is based on some slides that we had when we went to I think Alan's neighbourhood last weekend, which was southern and the down the southern highlands. This is basically the extent of the exploration titles that are on that are, that exist on paper at the moment. And this is putting into the local government area so that you just get an idea of why people are quite concerned about the cumulative impacts of what's going on. Now, obviously not all of these are operating at the moment, but they're they're there and they've been granted. Um, one of the big issues that's been coming to the fore this week, and um, I've had an unusual week for a, probably a nanosecond. I was agreeing with Tony Abbott. That's not something I normally do. Um, but it was only a nanosecond, but he did quite back down quite quickly. Um, but um, basically, one of the big issues, and this probably won't be as big of an issue for you in the Illawarra because a lot of the exploration is going on on public land, I think, as opposed to private land. But basically, um, one of the big issues is that the minerals and petroleum on people's land is not owned by the It is owned by the Crown. And so therefore they are able to grant, grant 
um, the expiration leases as they've been doing, as you've seen, over your property. And this is causing a lot of conflict, um, as you can see with a lot of the things that are going on at the gates. Um, and basically the government can authorise third parties to look for coal seam gas under the Petroleum Onshore Act as well. There's been a lot of deficiencies that have been highlighted and the government to its credit is probably fixing up a lot of these things at the moment and trying to make this process a bit better. Um, but it's your time to have a say on what the process should be. Coal seam gas does not always require development consent. Now I should say in the old Illawarra it does. So if you're doing coal seam gas ex ex exploration and development, you know, um, just for exploration, you do require development consent. But there are a lot of areas around New South Wales where you do not. And that's where I guess it's become quite easy with farmers and other agricultural communities. Um, there's a review of environmental factors that's done. We've seen major deficiencies with most of the reviews of environmental factors that's done at the exploration stage. They're certainly um, not particularly rigorous documents. And there wasn't always a requirement for people to be publicly notified um, or privately notified in person or with, you know, as you would with a development consent um, of exploration going on in your land. Basically, an ad went in the local paper and that's the only notice you got of it. And that's why landholders have been getting quite angry about these things because if they missed that, ad, they didn't even always sometimes know that their property was subject to an exploration um, lease. And they can also be fined for stopping people doing exploration on their properties at the end of the, at the, end of the negotiation process of that. Um, no one has been fined as yet, but I think it's going to be coming to a head in the next little while with some of the things that are going on with the gates. And there's certainly a, a considerable penalty if you said to someone that you didn't want them to come onto their, your land. There are significant environmental concerns about coal seam gas. Um, the National Water Commission, and I've got their position paper, if anyone wants to have a look at it, has part of, put out a position paper that we very much looked at as sort of a fairly respectable body that does you know, research into water resources, has said there is a considerable amount of uncertainty about what we know about the science of um, groundwater, and because of that, there is particular concerns about how that, you know, how that impacts when you're doing exploration that might impact on groundwater resources. And they also have expressed a lot of concern about um, the fracking process and also about wastewater and what we do about wastewater and from, that's generated from coal seam gas. One of the biggest problems that we've seen at the EDO is the cumulative impacts. So the fact that you're not looking across the spectrum at what's going on in a particular water catchment or you might not be looking at you know, what's going on in a particular local government area, that these assessments are done project by project. And that is one of the real big deficiencies in the law. Um, one of the other environmental issues that I'd like to address, because Tom's indicated, you know, spoken about this, is also just what we know about the greenhouse gas emissions from CSG at this stage. Um, I think there is a bit of a debate about the science as to how much greenhouse gas emissions are generated by coal seam gas. Um, certainly. What I would say is that our colleagues that we work with internationally are now saying in some jurisdictions where there has been decent policies that have been about promoting renewable energy, like California, gas and solar are now on a par dollar for dollar. So if you do have a decent support for a renewable energy industry, you don't always need to have gas as a transition to a cleaner, 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 cleaner greener environment and a more um, less greenhouse gas intensive environment from coal. We obviously have major issues in this country is how we are going to trans transition away from coal if we are going to address greenhouse gas emissions. But as I said, in California it's dollar for dollar. It is that competitive now in that market there because they have really promoted renewable energies and they've got solar them up and running and they have a whole solar industry. And I think that is the debate we need to be having is what do communities want? when they're looking at these renewable energy options and what do we want to be promoting. And that's going to be a big issue <laughs> with the debate that's going on at the moment, you know, nationally. There's a parliamentary inquiry going on, so your chance to have your say, if you want to have a say about these things. The terms of reference will be focusing on the environmental and health impacts of CSG, the economic and social implications, what's the role of CSG in meeting our future and energy needs and whether or not the legislation is any good. Submissions are being accepted until the 7th of September, so get ready. 
And um, there's going to be a whole lot of transitional provisions in place as well that are going to try and give the community more say about new expiration licences, although these are probably not going to be what you're concerned about down here because you're talking about existing expiration um, and existing approvals that are already been granted. But there is going to be changes to the way aquifers are dealt with as part of that process. So I think that's probably enough. Thank you very much.